The Miami Dolphins and the rest of the NFL are on the verge of the start of the legal tampering period today, yet the Dolphins still have some cap compliance moves to figure out. What is the holdup here today on Locked on Dolphins? You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked on Network. I'm your host, Cal Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked on Dolphins, co-host of Locked on NFL Scouting. Shout out to our everydayers. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast here on the Locked on Network because it is your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Dolphins is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $150 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So today on the show, we are going to be taking a look at, and it's early on Monday morning. It's like 5 a.m. Like the Russell Wilson to, to Pittsburgh news dropped a few hours ago. Wanted to give as much time as possible for this show in the event that new contract agreements did come out. This is always that sensitive time of year where you do a podcast and probably within two minutes, some new additional news headline has come out that has rendered the talking point that you wanted to record on the show relatively useless. So we, I've, I've taken this all the way up until the time to sit down and record and, and talk about this uh, Miami Dolphins pre-free agency mood. They made some re-signings over the weekend. We formerly heard about Teron Armstead from uh, – Ian Rappaport and Adam Schefter and all the heavy hitters in big media. But the Dolphins, the, the, the biggest thing for Miami right now is I know fans are kind of collectively like freaking out a little bit that you know this, this team is still not salary cap compliant. And just know, I think I guess I would start here. Just know if they needed to, or if they if they had to, the levers that are are there for them to pull, they could could execute. And be cap compliant with a snap of their fingers. Now, there's not long-term implications depending on what avenue you choose to take with the contracts. And I think the Teron Armstead situation is a perfect example where the report came out that he would be coming back on an adjusted contract. What does adjusted mean? Adjusted, I, I get the impression based on the verbiage of that report that that's not just a basic restructure. So and I know over the cap has this in their resources. And I know Joel Corey, who's a really big, I think he's with CBS sports uh, contract background guy. Uh, both of them have made it kind of clear throughout the, the course of their works that to do a basic restructure, which doesn't add any additional years onto a contract, the vast majority of NFL contracts have it baked into their contract that, that a team can execute a basic restructure with little to no red tape or hurdles or player feedback. They can just say, Hey, your salary is this, your salary is going to stay this. There's no additional years on your contract for, uh, from a bookkeeping perspective. We're going to write you a check. So that's the basic restructures to take salary and convert it into a signing bonus to do the more complex restructures. Like, adding void years to the back end of deals to further increase the runway for how much cap you can disseminate or to adjust a contract and adjust somebody's salary. Those sorts of things do require player feedback. And I think that's important to note because the Dolphins it, from reports tried to solicit a compensation change with linebacker Jerome Baker. They couldn't find mutual ground. They cut Jerome Baker. Uh, the same thing's happening in uh, San Francisco with Eric Armstead. This came out last night. This is a last-minute thing, and it, it's, a, it's a big addition to the free agent pool in the interior defensive line class. Eric Armstead was due to make $17.14 million, $1, million in salary this year. The 49ers reportedly came to him and asked to take a pay cut, and he said no. So they, they're cutting him. He's going to be in the free agency pool. So it seems like from Miami's perspective, 
they're exploring all of that kind of stuff first instead of just defaulting into the uh, just basic restructure and we can do it like this because they know at the end of the day, if they need to, they can do it like this. I'm snapping my fingers if you're not on YouTube. But the challenge with that and the reason why you wait, deadline spur action, as the saying goes, there's no take backsies on that. So what happens if you take the maximum amount of money that you could restructure out of hypothetically uh, Jalen Ramsey's contract and then you have the opportunity to or, or you realize later down the road you don't have maybe the same viability of a contract extension that would help alleviate some of that pressure that you're putting into future years on Jalen Ramsey's cap management. So do you want to default and restructure if there's another way to do it? For Bradley Chubb, right? We did it in the offseason blueprint. We said, look, you can restructure Bradley Chubb. You can create this much cap space, about $14 million. And then you could post June 1st Bradley Chubb after next year and transition away from that contract if you needed to and save $20 million post June 1st, but you can't touch money till post June 1st. What if they what if they don't want to have to have a post June first exit ramp on Bradley Chubb? Well, that means you you're going to have other conversations, or you're hoping to get contract extensions done and, and exhaust all the other avenues. Or what happens if a player comes up in a trade conversation, a big galaxy brain trade conversation? That's like, well, well, we can't really trade him. We just we just restructured his contract. Where if you didn't restructure it and there was just salary up front that you could say, okay, there's cap relief for us to trade for a swap of assets. That, I think, is and maybe they're co going to, to more players and, and talking about performance versus pay and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm sure to some degree that they are. But it's not as though there's this red tape around these basic contract moves that they can make that would prevent them from being in a place where they're cap compliant and then having to deal with the ramifications of that. If push comes to shove, if they get to the deadline and they have all the information that they need to say, okay, this is the market for these players. Uh, this, this is a better feel for what our free agency plan is going to look like then they'll execute that and they'll be compliant for the start of the league calendar year, just like every other team in the history of the NFL has always been. Nothing to lose sleep over. Uh, but we mentioned Toronto Armstead. More on him in just a moment here on Locked on Dolphins. Make sure that you stick with us. We're going to talk about that next. Passion, drive, and patience are what brings home the winning trophy, but it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance, from superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for, and with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time for your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home the dub. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit available only to U.S. customers. So the Dolphins got the news yesterday, or I should say we got the news yesterday that uh, Toronto said officially going to be back in the game for Miami in 2024, which I think is a good thing. When you consider what this free agency market looks like at offensive tackle, if you would have had to add that, and now it's a great year for the draft. With all, It's an incredible year in the draft. And depending on how the board breaks and depending on what else the, the Dolphins accomplish in the early stages of free agency, if you told me that they were going to take their first-round pick and draft a tackle that could play guard and play him at guard early, and then there's your long-term plan at tackle to replace Teron Armstead. Uh, I think it'd be a great plan, but you'd hate to paint yourself into a corner. Um, and, and this offensive tackle free agency class has Tyron Smith from Dallas, and it sounds like he's going to test the market. And a whole bunch, a whole bunch of nothing, a whole bunch of absolutely nothing. You got to get down to the guy, names like George Fant, Donovan Smith, Jonah Williams. 
fringe starters, Jermaine Illuminor. He was here. Dolphins cut him, goes to the Raiders, different scheme, has some success. Obviously, Kendall Lamb is a Dolphins player. We'll talk more about Dolphins players' re-signings here in just a minute here on the show. But um, you were going to be in for a rough ride if you needed, on top of several starters on the interior, if you needed an offensive tackle, that was going to be a really bumpy road. And there were going to be financial implications for this. So I'm glad Toronto Armstead is back. I'm fascinated to find out what the quote-unquote reworked or adjusted contract is. That could be any number of things. That could be deferring pay to 2025. And, you know, is that guaranteed money? Is that stipulated money? Is that, you know, uh, just restructuring into a, another uh, refinanced signing bonus? I would think not. But Teron Armstead, I mean, he he's not due for a small hit. He's on the books for, for the Dolphins in their cap perspective at, it's twenty point six million is the uh, salary cap hit for Toronto Armstead this year. Adjusting this could be any number of different things. I'm curious how much of this is, and he already has some of this in his contract. He has a one million dollar roster bonus each year on his contract: twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five, twenty twenty six. 2024, 2025, and that is whatever percentage of games, it's a per game bonus. Each game that you're active, you get a prorated amount of the maximum amount of money, which is $1 million. Do they take more of that salary? Is he willing to take more of that salary and put it into a per game bonus of being active? And from Miami's perspective, you want to go out and play all 17 games? Pfft. Great, Teron Armstead. We'll we'll pay you the 13 and a quarter you're due this year in, in base salary. Um, he's got some other finances. He's got six hundred fifty thousand dollars in miscellaneous bonuses uh, from the from making the Pro Bowl last year, uh, and then he has five hundred eighty eight thousand from last year's per game active bonuses. So he did not make either of the playing time incentives. On his contract, if he played 65% of the snaps, he would have earned $300,000. Uh, if he had played 70% of the snaps, he would have earned $400,000. And that continues to scale based on percentage of play. So this kind of language is already in Teron Armstead's contract, which makes it really interesting to me that they're talking about reworking the deal. Is this just a matter of, hey, you're due $5 million in guaranteed uh, we're going to take that and we're going to put that, move that money to 2025 and not create a longer ramp way. So it's just year one relief. And then if you play next year, we can figure it out. And if you don't play next year, you still get $5 million and we'll carry that in addition to whatever dead money that you carry. Although that really makes him a, a net even unless somebody else were to sign him from from a dead cap perspective uh right now if, for 2025 if you moved on pre-june 1st from toronto armstead in 2025 you'd save eight million dollars against the cap if you went post june 1st you'd save 14.3 so taking more money and putting that into 2025 instead of doing a re-signing or a basic restructure is not really that appealing so is this stipulated money how much is toronto willing to make it stipulated money what percentage of the 13 and a quarter that he's owed a lot, I get a lot of questions, and I'm fascinated to see what they ultimately do end up cooking up for Teron Armstead, who's been willing to play ball with all the, this kind of stuff when he signed the five-year, $75 million contract to play in Miami. Um, and the the catch that he has received to this point, uh, he got 15.2 in 2022. He got 18.11 last year. Right now, he's owed 14.2 this upcoming season. And if a higher percentage of that, other than just a million dollars of the 2025 hit, which he may be walking away from if he ends up retiring, considering we, we took it to right up to the start of the league year for whether or not you were to play this year. Um, 
I think that could put the Dolphins in position to have a little bit more peace of mind that they're getting what they pay for, which you obviously want to have when you're a team that has the kind of talent that Miami has collected. And uh, a lot of it, unfortunately, was not on the field for you last year. But the Dolphins have not let their lack of cap compliance, including whatever they're going to do with Teron Armstead, prevent them from starting to get some guys under contract, guys that were expiring contracts. That is next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Make sure you stick with us. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game in the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing with America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with your Fest $5 bet. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who is going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So Miami was busy over the weekend, despite the perception because of the this, this salary cap um, waiting game that we're all playing. Players that are returning for the Dolphins. Some of them were on the offseason blueprint last week. Some of them were not. I generally don't have a, uh, a disappointment on any of the players that are back. Elijah Campbell. This was a player that was on the offseason blueprint. Special teams, staple type of player, really good kick coverage player, uh, safety. He got pressed in action a few times last year in the, on the defensive side of the ball. I, I think ideally that's that's not where he plays. I think if you were to have injuries, you, you'd probably prefer to bring in a vet and leave Elijah Campbell in the special teams role that he's in. I think that's where he's really good. He's back. Uh, Rob Jones, offensive lineman, is back. Out of last year's group, I would probably place him talent perspective or performance perspective behind Armstead, behind Lamb, behind Jackson. Keon Smith, we just don't have enough volume to, to kind of get an accurate gauge. So I'd say definitively behind those three tackles. He's behind Isaiah Wynn. He's behind Connor Williams. He's behind Robert Hunt. So this is probably your eighth offensive lineman? Probably. But from a financials perspective, he played tackle in college. He can play both guard spots for you. Uh, I think he's certainly a more impactful player than Lester Cotton. And I think his play as guard is better than what we've seen from Liam Eikenberg. He just can't snap. So I, I'm not sad to see Rob Jones back by any means. I think he's a quality depth into your offensive lineman. I think if he is brought into the season and carried into the season with the intention of being a starter, I'm going to be underwhelmed. I certainly hope that's not the case. I hope there's a lot more work that's done on the offensive lineman to ensure that that doesn't happen. Because right now your interior group on the line is Rob Jones, Lester Cotton, and Lee Meikenberg. <laughs> Uh, but those guys were starters for you a lot last year. Don't let them be starters this year. So I totally applaud Rob Jones being back on a what's presumably a low dollar deal for an uh, experienced player in the system. There's not a lot of downside in that as, as somebody who you think is a quality death player who can play more than one spot. But don't let him be a star. Nick Needham's back. Which, look, Nick's value is this. He can play in the nickel. He could play safety. He can play on special teams. You'd ideally like to think in 2024, being a year fully removed from that Achilles tear, he's going to be a little bit more back to the athletic profile that's at his peak. And this was a player who, even when he first came into the league, athleticism really wasn't like his game. He was tough. He tackled well. He was instinctive. Um, and he played well in the slot where he had kind of protections to players who are a little bit more athletically adverse. So then you take that and you have an Achilles and coming off an Achilles tear and it's just, it's a bad mix. So I'm, I'm hoping that Nick Needham back in 2024 is a little bit more of the player that we saw prior, but a guy who can be a safety, he could be a, be a third safety. He could be a nickel player, uh, kind of a positionless player. Again, versatility to kind of maximize around your, your cornerstone type of players. That's the thought process. 
Uh, so Nick Deenum's back. He wasn't on the blueprint, but um, the fact that he does have that versatility is the upsell there. And I certainly don't think that, that that's a player that, that is brought back based on what we're kind of hearing about the, the commitment of that contract that's being brought back for definitively like a starting role or anything like that. I think there's two guys looming. Well, maybe three guys looming, but I, I think Brandon Jones is looming. I don't know whether Javon Holland was was teasing anything or not with the tweet over the weekend, but he did 29 times eight or whatever. And obviously Brandon Jones wears 29 and Javon Holland wears eight. Uh, I have heard that there is interest there in um, retaining his services. Brandon Jones, I think, is a special team. I, th- I, I put this together over the weekend when I first kind of heard this these rumblings. Um, if you were looking for a Geno Stone type of player, and look, I know Geno Stone got seven interceptions last year, but I also know what Geno Stone athletically is as a player. I know what his build is as a player. He's not quite, Brandon Jones is a better like run support player, but from a size, athleticism, general ball skills perspective, I think Brandon Jones could do some of the same things as Geno Stone in that defense that Anthony Weaver is bringing over to Miami. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's going to pick off a bunch of passes next year either. But this scheme has a little bit more flexibility for guys that can play on the roof or simultaneously play low in the box. And that was kind of the big standoff of the Vic Fangio scheme was it's like, well, we want to run two highs and we don't want to tip our hand by having personnel in key spots. And Brandon Jones, if you play him low, you expect he's either he's going to bring pressure or he's going to uh, be a run support player. And you're probably going to get zone coverage. If he's going to play high, you say, okay, you know, we are probably expecting kind of the core coverages of the defense and he's just going to play whatever half or quarter assignment that he has. So I, I think a, a defensive scheme that can have a little bit more flexibility for the players probably puts Brandon Jones in a better position to be successful. I don't think it's a coincidence that his success has came in 2020, 2021, 2022 with the Flores Boyer type of scheme where they did move players around. I don't think that's a coincidence. So if he's back, I think that that's an omen there. And I do expect the team to figure something out with Andrew Van Kinkle. I know that there's a lot of interest. I've heard that from more than one place. I know some of my friends in in the content creation space for the Dolphins, they have heard that as well. Um, The Dolphins obviously have the need. That's another one of those internal players. And I know everybody who's concerned about the, the, the precedent that's set of letting Christian Wilkins walk out the door for a player who came in and did everything you asked of him and got better and you're not going to pay him versus what happened to draft and develop. I think Andrew Van Ginkle belongs in that conversation. I think they think Andrew Van Ginkle belongs in that conversation in the same way that uh, they have already rewarded guys like uh, Austin Jackson. They've rewarded guys like Zach Sealer, who they didn't draft, but they developed. That draft and develop or acquire and develop, that player development pipeline, the Dolphins are rewarding those players. Durham Smythe, Jerome Baker, Xavier Howard. Those are good examples of this team. Uh, it's just what happens when an interior defensive line market dries up, a player's intent on completely maximizing his value and is expected to get top of market money. Same for Robert Hunt at guard. That's the unfortunate intersection of those guys played well enough where the, they want to maximize their value. They're going to do that only by going to the market and figuring out, okay, here are the kind of offers that I get cross-reference that with what Miami's offering, cross-reference that with state income tax and so on and so forth and moving my family and all that stuff. What kind of signing bonus up front am I getting offered? And then they'll do that math and they'll make that decision that's best for them. But I think Nick Neenum, Rob Jones, Elijah Campbell is a nice start. Uh, I would not be surprised if either Andrew Van Ginkle or Brandon Jones is next. Sounds like they'd like to figure something out with Isaiah Wynn, although I don't think that's going to be a super high in demand player because the injury that he's coming off of and the injury history there. Uh, so I'd look for those maybe next. I'd look for some, some salary cap maneuvers as well. 
Try to get the Dolphins aligned and started to move in the right direction. Then we'll figure out what happened with Teron Armstead. That is next this week. So make sure you keep it locked in right here on Locked on Dolphins. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Appreciate you guys for checking the show. Make it a great rest of your day. Fins up. I'll be back to talk to you all again soon.